my friends, I'm Rick and this is Little Missy. We're looking at uh, still on cycle 17 of a game not traveled. So we've been on cycle 17 for a couple months now. You know, a little here, a little there, it's kind of way it goes. We've had a lot of events, a lot of follow-ups, some other interesting stuff, right? And so on and so forth. So let me get over here and switch this one on and put Little Missy down here. Come up. Why don't you get down here? Unless you get down here, we got to straighten out stuff. Thankfully, got less room here. Cause we gonna do some things and some stuff, right? Uh, I can't start a video without me griping a little bit, right? Uh, I was uh, working late uh, Thursday night. I had uh, uh, I was on my second, finished my second load. Technically, I should have went back for a partial load, uh, but it was going on. Uh, it was after midnight. And uh, I just la uh, left the sewer plant where we unload everything when uh, I heard a, a pop sound and I started smelling antifreeze. I look out my side mirror and I can see a trail of antifreeze behind the truck. And I thought, crap. So I pulled over and it's just everything's gushing out from under the front of the truck. And uh, we had to have it towed, uh, turned the water pump blew up. So we lost the water pump on it. Uh, I believe they were able to get it fixed. That's that's so they they got it in early Friday morning to, and figured out what it was. And I'm guessing it was a little slow because he before I even called him, he'd already sent a guy to get, go get the water pump. So I'm guessing that they had it done by uh, Friday evening, uh, Saturday morning. They I got a a message, a phone call. I'm guessing it was from them. Uh, I didn't follow up on it because it's my weekends off. Uh, this weekend off, so uh, I'm not freighting about it. I'm just figuring first thing in the morning I'm going to go down there and uh, get there about the time their people show up and see if the truck's done. Hopefully it is because I got a, another long week ahead of me, including uh, several out of town trips. Uh, tomorrow I would be doing three hotels locally in a, in a, rest, a small restaurant and then uh, drive up to Denison, Iowa, which is where uh, the uh, home of Donna Reed, if you're familiar with who that person was. Uh, anyway, it's a couple hours, two and about two and, uh, two and 50, two hours, 15 minute drive from where I'm at up and then back. And it's basically a 10 minute, 15 minutes to do the actual job. Uh, so about a five hour round trip just for 15 minutes worth of uh, work. And uh, I managed to pick up a second place up there uh, on the caveat that as long as uh, I'll charge them in town rate you know because the mileage just is it kills it kills people so this other guy would never have been able to afford us but uh, I told him I says you know what if, if you just let me do it the same time I come up and get this other place I'll just charge you the 95 bucks plus tax we would charge you if you're here in town because he has places here in town that we do so I did him I, I did him a solid but at the same time I did us a solid because we now go up there for two jobs and I added an extra 90 bucks 100 bucks to the to the trip and uh, anyway, and then I got to go down the opposite side of the state uh, to do a, a restaurant, I think, the uh, Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon. So, kind of crap this week. Yeah, it's a, I don't need that truck run, I need that water pump going. Anyway, so, uh, I was able, my characters are by NPC, uh, we negotiated with a, a merchant captain to locate uh, where the nearest trade world is. And we know it's 29 light years, 29 light years away, and uh, I'll write that down. And I didn't, uh, you know, north by north, which is for shits and giggles. All right, so the next step, of course, is because we got this information from the, the captain in negotiations, what this has given is he didn't. I, I envision this is that the captain not just agreed that he knew where it was, but he we obtained the actual coordinates and, and basic information for that. Plus, the Imperium database that's available to the players uh, is pretty extensive. So one can make an argument that even if we're this far out and on the fringe and we're not actively hooked up to a, a, a communications net so we can't update our, our, our digital libraries on a regular basis, our archaic library, i.e. the one we came with, is still functional. It's still is about as up to date as anything what can be. So uh, once we know the coordinates, it's not hard to 
call up that coordinate and, and get a name and a place and etc and all the information we need so that just expedites stuff that's just how I justify uh, exploiting or setting it up and the odds are like I said this should be the only trade world we should not encourage a second one uh, because it's a it's not needed it's an unnecessary and it can be unbalancing as well especially if it turns out to be closer and you can make all the arguments you want if you want to have six of them and you want one on every corner of your house knock yourself out all right you know who's to say so but what we do want to know is the basics so we'll start with what kind of planet it is and because it's a trade world we need to make some common sense de deductions here just for clarity's sake, the odds of a, of, a, of a thriving trade world on a scale that we expect the trade worlds, trade, words, trade worlds to function as, you're not likely to have it built on an airless rock. You're not going to move build one on the moon when building one on Mars would be much more better even though Mars itself is extremely hostile. So perhaps if you found a planet that was kind of like Earth, with a breathable atmosphere, 10 times more likely to be the place you want to build any kind of significant colony, let alone a trade world. So that said, we'll, we'll just do a caveat that it is a normal, breathable world, which just that alone is enough, enough variety in there for the build modifiers to vary. Now this also plays a role because in part, the higher the build modifiers, the more expensive it is to build shit on this world and to maintain it indefinitely. So if you have a world that a 2.0 build modifier where it costs twice as much in materials and cash to manufacture to produce to build a, a factory at, than it and then it would to build on a standard Earth-like planet, it's still expensive. But it's not unreasonable. Now, if you have a build modifier of 4 point up, four times what it would cost to build on an Earth-like planet, well, that's quite expensive. So a trade world still can be viable with that kind of atmosphere, or that kind of build modifiers. But it, in common sense consideration, it would be a less thriving, less impressive world. So if I were to have, I don't know, a standard Earth planet as a trade world, and it has, let's just say, 50 million people for residents, which compared to our colonies is just like, you know, that's an ocean compared to our, our, our thimble of water. Uh, but for a thriving trade world, no. Which is another reason why we don't want things like that, a lot of them, and right next to our place. Because it just overshadows everything we got. Why build factories on your planet if it's just cheaper to truck it in from 10 light years away? Why develop your planet unless you have to? And that's how play, and I've seen players do it. So, and there's some detriment to that. There's some downside to that. Uh, anyway. So the higher the build modifier in my mind reduces the modifiers for the world. So we take that into account because we're going to want to know a lot of stats about this place because it sets up how we understand how to set up the exchange for this place and at the end of the day what we want to know is the plus and minuses for the purchasing and selling of material and manufactured uh, goods from this trade world because at the end of the day that's the whole point of the trade world is for us to be shipping our raw materials here and, and making money off of them to buy much needed material and, and quantities we can't manufacture for ourselves anytime soon. And we're going to do this in part to expedite the, the, the construction of our house. You know, we want to, uh, as soon as I can get one going, I want to get a heavy foundry going. I want heavy steel. <clears throat> I want increased steel production. I want heavy steel. I want a number of items that's not being produced. Uh, there's there's another factory that we really need to have. I think I, I should get a second agri concern up as soon as possible. Being dependent on the single one is kind of, eh, right? And then there's 
housing issues and then with that comes other if issues uh, the infrastructure uh, has to be f uh, filled out and grow so I can get to the second infrastructure level and get started at that point then I would have to also start doing civic builds and and things like wastewater treatment facilities and and uh, yeah, all this yeah, the list is quite extensive as to the the tree of shit that you can need to build or can build for your colony, right? So the fact that you can go to the nearest hardware store and pick up everything you can uh, need on the cheap kind of steals away from that in my uh, experience. So first things first, let's roll. Uh, I'll be using the red as my ten, and so I get uh, a whole three. Yeah. So a three is a standard breathable planet. Hurrah. So this is an Earth-like with a build modifier of 1.0 and a population modifier of 0, 0, 010, 0, 0, right? So we know it's breathable and we know uh, that it's a standard so it's pretty close to earth uh, at that point the only other thing i think of that i would want to uh, maybe know is oh and then we also know that the system obviously is not a hazard it's not it's not blocked off and there's not a, uh, a part of a nebula or or a pulsar or something like that so we know that the system is safe but what we don't know is can, you know what the system is made up of. So technically speaking, you can make a choice. You can just ask, say that all that astronomic information is available to you. Which by 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 common sense things, once again, you could either say that the that like the coordinates and the information on the world itself, the system information was included by the ship captain. Or, because once we knew what the world was and its coordinates, we were able to go to our star charts that our, you know, our colony has and pinpoint the ship, uh, the system. And because it's a well-established planet, the entire system has been filled in and we would know uh, the major planets and moons and whatever and what have you. So we could go do all that. So, and I probably will do that at, at, at uh, a later point. Uh, off video because it's not necessary just so I have that information because who knows what else is in that system key thing here on trade worlds though is that everything in the system is owned and controlled by the trade world now how the trade worlds operated can vary it could be a fringe version which is run by some syndicates and a combination of other things it could be a bunch of independents it could be an imperium established trade uh, 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 trade call but at the end of the day, it's a neutral ground as far as the Imperium's concerned, and uh, for all house interactions and stuff like this, it also means that the system itself is non grata You can't come in as a house lord and annex the trade world in its system. The Imperium says you can't do that, so as for game mechanics, we just say you can't do that. And then to make it much more so we don't end up with one literally in our back pocket, because I had that happen once on a play test. Uh, one of the players did this, and we played it out to see how it went, and it unbalanced his game something fierce. Uh, so we established that there is a three light year bubble. So the system itself, and then every light year around it for three light years, I see I'm missing. Every light year around it for three light years is part of the trade world. So any settlements or, or that are located on those in those systems or any mining outfits, all that stuff, are affiliated to the trade world. So these might be satellite colonies of the trade world to produce food and, and raw materials and stuff that get shipped to the trade world for their own reasons, their own purposes, doesn't matter. But from a game perspective, this is another reason why we want the trade world to be more than 10 light years away from our border because it's going to take up a small little chunk of space so it's, it's important to kind of keep that in mind so anyway we'll go check and see how many moves it's just a straight straight roll and I get I'm going to re-roll that one I get an exact hundred so there is no moon no moon at all Right. Hmm. Think for some interesting title crap, wouldn't you think? Anyway, 
So we're going to flip back here, way to the back of the book. Oh, oh uh, let's see. So, I have been poking away at, before I get off into this one, uh, I have been poking away at uh, trying to get an updated, releasable version of this game done. So, excuse me, on 80, page 82, 84-ish, right, it's taking it longer than I, yeah, sometimes it can take a, day or two, you know, six or seven hours of work to get a single page done because of so much detail. So if you look at where I'm at, I'm cur currently in this area, it's called commercial freight and passenger service. So it gives us all the information we need to know things like, once again, and it's related to the trade world. So once I establish a trade envoy and I send somebody there a small delegation and set up an office where I can operate. I have a now where every time I do my cycle turn, I'll have a, si a little side section for devoted to the trade world and what I'm doing there and not doing there, etc. And so in this case, my physical my physical agents have to take physical physically take credit to the trade world and or goods. To get there it requires shipping material and people passengers. So when we look at this section on this for the commercial stuff, we're looking at this, this, you know, uh, how much does it cost? How much does it cost per what? So we begin as an example, uh, it's five credits per hundred tons per light year in unexplored space with a times 10 modifier. So if I want to ship that same 100 tons and I'm going to send it down on a guild owned ship down a full uh, a, a, a trace that's partially explored, then I'm reducing it to a, a 2.5 cost. So now instead of costing me uh, 50 credits per light year to drive uh, you know, to draw, uh, ship 100 tons of shit, uh, it's going to cost me a, a 12 and a half credits per light year to ship 100 tons of stuff. And so the point there is is that the less the trial the less the route is known, the less safe it is, the more expensive it's going to be to ship things and to travel on it. If you're going to some place nobody's been before, they're going to charge you through the nose because they're risking their life and limb and their livelihood to to achieve this. And usually you would do this through a negotiation. This is why generally speaking we use scouts cheapo scout ships to break the break you know into a, an unknown spot a piece of space to verify 100 percent exactly what the hell's there so if we lose it it's not such a big deal but a huge cruise liner is not going to roll through uncharted space so the odds are these big cruise liners that arrive over my little colony for example already have considerable knowledge of the shipping routes and they wouldn't be here if they didn't have uh, at least uh, some inclination as to what's out here. And then you marry that to the range. Now these bigger, the bigger the ship, the further they can jump, the further they can move in a single jump. So that said, if my single current generation uh, a crew, uh, a scout ship can only jump one time, and then it can only move, it can only move two light years. Even though it has the potential capacity, range-wise, of going for six of those jumps, it potentially can go 12 light years on a single line, or six out and six back, potentially. Or no, five. So five out and five back. Uh, the movement makes that take time. So if you have a cruise liner that's 10,000, 15,000 tons of ship, now you're carrying like the equivalent of 100,000 tons of, of, of mass, and on a 10,000 ton frame as an example, then uh, this ship's jump capacity range-wise is probably going to be 10, 12 light years per jump. And so it could have been another sector, it could literally have been nearby a sector away and make that single jump and not worry about what's in between because we now know that the system that we colonized, but according to as far as the Imperium is concerned, is a safe place to jump to. Meanwhile, right, so 
that said, we, it just plays its role. So, you know, cost, and then there's also modifiers for like how fast you want shit to get there. If you're, you know, if you want to expedite it, we get it to you overnight. You're going to pay through the nose for it. Uh, and then we talk about uh, uh, sending passengers over here and, and sending credits, all right? So credits require that the house have access to a secure 90% or better communications link to the world which they are sending credits. Then says, see communications in the blueprint guide for further details. Once again, we are 29 light years, let's just make it rounded up, 30 light years from my capital. My capital currently has a tech level one system communications uh, uh, network in the system. Which means anything I colonize or build or, or, or put into space inside my home system is 100% connected to the colony by this SCN. Now if I build a, or set a colony three light years away, so now I, need, I have a, a planet that's three light years from my capital, my SCN can still reach that colony and back at a significantly reduced percentage. So the odds are pretty good that I'm not going to be able to send credits. I'm not gonna have that 90% reliability factor even that close. So what I would need to do is to build, put a commsat in, the cheapest thing is to put a communication, uh, either a communications array in orbit, uh, a commsat in orbit, which is different, different thing, and or an Orion, a portable Orion communications array for, set up on the planet. And this then would allow me to get that 90% communications between the two. But I'm still woefully short of reaching that trade world's 30 light year deal. So this is where I, they talk about it, it, it. It's inevitable that I'm going to, as a house, start plotting a route to the trade world because I need to know what's in every system between here and there. Eventually I want to have a 100% broke, unbroken line of known space between the two, linking them together. Because at that point it becomes a trade route and it, might, it reduces cost and speeds up how long it takes for things to move. We facilitate that by putting commsats. Roughly, it says six light years, uh, but the broth off percentages are quite high. I, I, I recommend every four five at a pinch. So let's just say every five. That means I would need to have, I would have to have five commsats. Technically, I would need to have four commsats in place between my colony and the trade world. And the reason I said that is, is because the SCN on my, on my trade, on my capital, they say we give it that five light year window and then I need a commsat in that system, which then boosts my signal out another light, another five light years to the next commsat. So we create this link. Now that link means at this point we can send credits back and forth. If we want a hundred percent unbroken reliability, because there's always a percentage that you send ship, you ship your credits electronically. There is a percentage here that you can roll and roll up and lose those credits. That's the danger of shipping. So if you want to have a reduce that to uh, almost zero percent, it's 100 percent. You're going to need a commsat in every system along the way. So I would need to have 27 commsats because the colonial or the uh, the trade world itself has its own SCN. It would be whatever is equivalent for the infrastructure level, right? And, and that means it's more than. I don't have to put one in that system and of course I have the at my own communications network in my home system so those two are systems that are are, are, are you know already factored in so we want to know that stuff we get back here to this section here and this section is also dealing with uh, discovering NPC houses so every now and then we get mention of a possible NPC house so here's the mechanics of how to establish one and how to set them up and generally how you run them is as a as a as a foe as a potential foe or trait partner but it's always an NPC and it should always be rolled accordingly as an NPC so don't assume that they'll agree to anything and everything you want and have to negotiate with them and just remember negotiations can go south and relationships potentially could go south you could become friendly with an NPC house and have benefits from trade and, and, and interactions with each other through these negotiations 
or a combination of bad negotiations could turn them into an opponent. All right. But then we can make that argument there's a whole slew of event roles that could easily be uh, manipulated that way depending on how you look at it. So, you know, right. And then the same thing with fringe ports. So we want to know about a fringe port. There's the information. So here's what we got for trade worlds. The very picture of a thriving trade world is one in a million of one is one of millions of thingies, all genomes residing and conducting business in a uh, neutral market. A zone free for uh, free from government taxes and house oversight. Typically, a trade world hosts guilds, fringe groups, and small levels of imperial bureaucracy. Most major bureaus have offices and annexes on trade worlds, but the imperium typically leaves the day-to-day -day governing to the guild masters who make up the trade world's government. We have the Imperium Free Market Zones. One cannot speak of trade worlds without talking about the Imperium policy regarding such worlds. Once a trade world is established, the Imperium declares the surrounding star systems to be annexed and part of the trade world's free market zone. Noble houses are denied permission to colonize or otherwise lay claim to a free market zone. Any house whose regional control brushes against or encompasses a free market zone is reclassified the Imperium as to enforce the degree. I.e., if you were to allow this trade world to be right next to your capital, you've just found yourself being relocated because the Imperium will make your house move. She basically, the, your game at that point just ended before it got started because now you've got to restart someplace else. So, and once you dismantle your colony ship, that literally means the, you know, they pack your ass up and move you out because you made a bad choice. Now, in your defense, it's quite possible to establish yourself on a, in a system and then, then start to explore the next system over and suddenly discover the damn trade world. If that's how you let the mechanics fall. Which is why I sit there and the caveat says in here there should be a minimum of 10 light years away. In part because you do not want this big big free zone in your middle of your space. For starters, it'll be a hive, a magnet for all kinds of nefarious people that will come in through and you think you're going to benefit from it, but you're not. You know, I mean, it's just, it just, do it if you want to. That's, I guess, would be my thing. If that's what you want to play, knock yourself out. So, it says here, for example, the Imperium Fair, uh, Fair Trade Act Decree 87B 978C 9160D House Lords are forbidden to conduct inter interworld trading. This applies to exchange of any NBC controlled world, i.e., no player and player's notes. While the game mechanics allow for intra-world uh, intra trading, this creates a potentially major imbalance in galactic economy. Player could buy a, a large amounts of MM or MR from one NPC world and ship them commercially to another. All right, so basically what the, this is, is saying is, look, I actually had a player who was more in, 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 was really keen on the exchange system more than anything else. They really loved this buying and trading crap. And so to, for him, the game revolved more about that than anything else. And in part because of him, my system developed much richer and, deep, and deeper details. Because I had, I had to, to, to respond to his challenges and to his questions and to try to figure out how to make the shit work better. And so uh, one of the things that we came into conclusion was, it's quite possible for you to establish yourself with a load of cash and then just ignore your colony altogether and just focus on purchasing shit from the say this trade world and then sh and then shipping it to six different other places because you've negotiated information on these locations and then you've hired people to go there and set up offices for you and because you're on a you know you set up your your trade plan you're on a trade world for example blah 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 you know and if that's the kind of game you want to play and you want to make that game hey but that's not how the game's meant to be played. And so there's kind of, that's where that caveat kind of come in there. Do it what you're going to do, but, you know, it explains it. So it says, talk about locating a trade world. There should be no more than a few trade worlds within a sparsely settled sector that your house is colonized. Their newly rolled trade worlds must be a minimum of 10 light years, preferably more from a house-controlled region. Trade worlds must be located at a minimum of three regions apart, or 30. So that said... We've established where we know where the, the closest trade world is, 29 light years away. That means, potentially, there's the next one would be another 31 light years 
in the opposite direction potentially because they don't want to have you know if you look at uh, uh, a, a quadrant map which would be a hundred sector or region maps so my house is set up in a little region but the region is, is 10 by 10 by 10 so the center the center system established where my, my house goes and I everything within 10 light years is house space and you make that argument whether it's a sphere or a cube or whatever I don't care but that's that's the dynamics so for it would for every one of that that makes a a a, uh, a region okay a uh, hundred square light years of space uh, makes up a region which is controlled by whomever so in this case our house my house established now it controls this region of a hundred light years uh, square right and the trade world would then be two of those light years, those two of those regions away. So it's actually in its own region of space with another region in between mine and it. So that puts us at roughly, you know. So in this case, the same thing goes the other direction. I, I'm not going to have two. So this just we made this so you couldn't get two trade worlds ten light years apart, kind of thing. So at the minimum, they have to be. A, a, uh, 30 light years apart or however that plays out and uh, right if the quadrant contains part of a major tradeway at times 5 movement the trade world will have a route at times 2 usually named after itself connecting itself to the nearest trade world so once I get to the trade world it'd be an easy thing just an easy search role to establish where the next the the connector the connector from the trade world is to the nearest hyper route now it's possible the hyper route actually comes to the trade world and passes through but the odds are probably not in that favor it's more likely to be a a, a trace so in this case we're going to have a, a a regular trade route with half the movement it's not that hyperspace trade route so a hyper trade route is so so hyperly accurately ma mapped and maintained by the Imperium that it, you know the deviations for it are always in the computer unless you've been in the, in the middle of nowhere for a hundred years kind of thing uh, and it's also maintained generally by the Imperium <clears throat> everything else is, is established by independence guilds and and houses so in the case of the the guilds would have established a solid communications and uh, a link 100% between the trade world and the and the nearest major uh, hyper route and so this trade route has a modifier it's 2.0 so it, you can move twice as fast now we think about that versus the hyper so when I talk about a, a cruise liner that has a jump uh, movement factor of 10 so it moves 10 light years when it jumps and if it's on a uh, on a regular trade route that has a 2.0, a, a, a times two modifier, it's going to move 20 light years, or, or it's gonna move that 10 light years in, in half the time. So, or, or twice, no, twice the time. So we're gonna be able to jump 20 light years along this route, if the route's 20 light years long, in one jump, as opposed to two jumps. And so the hyper route's five times that. So a hyper route at cruise liner could be traveling 50 light years at a, at a jump as long along one of these hyper hyper routes the super highways kind of shit so this is kind of how that stuff plays out and we and it's just to know so it goes on to creating a trade world use the creating worlds rules below the trade worlds uh, world has an infrastructure tech to complete at a minimum so npc house control worlds we're ignoring that creating an npc house or an npc world trade worlds and npc house controls worlds exact etc Designing a trade world uh, begins with like any other roll up 10% of the system. Uh, we already established this. We know what it is, moons and stuff like that. Already did all that. So we got our bill modifier and our uh, a uh, population growth. If during the exploration phase of the system, no breather worlds, but you know, it's a caveat, we've already skipped that. So determine the level infrastructure. The next step is to determine the level infrastructure completed. Now you think about infrastructure for a minute. And I gave a lot of thought to this. This is also something I did a little, I, it was one of my topics in college, right? Because I was potentially going to be a, uh, a, a, a CAD drafter, a, you know, anyway. Uh, 
Infrastructure is everywhere. If you go to uh, the most bush, bush remote cabin in in the deep woods, in the Alaska outback or the whatever you can think of, you will still find infrastructure. Right? What do you mean infrastructure? Well, the pathways that you create to get around that you be familiar with so you you know eventually create your own crude road to the nearest road i.e. your own trace your own trace route right and uh, you're going to you know, try to make sure if there's any creeks or things you got to bridge them you're going to bridge them you're going to put a board across them or a log or maybe a series of logs something heavy enough that you can drive your ATV across and that's improving your infrastructure you see where I'm going with that so just keeping a clearing around your cabin is infrastructure Having a, a you know an outhouse somewhere is infrastructure. All that is infrastructure. So we call that very basic stuff. Very basic. So when our colony first set up, my first my colony first set up, my current infrastructure is like two percent. It starts out at one percent because that's the immediate things that they do to make things passable and suitable for your colony. So my colony's laid out. I determined it was going to be like a town. So there's these X amount of buildings, X amount of commercial space with roads in between, et cetera, et cetera. But the roads are just dirt. They're literally dirt because I don't have anything established for them. You know? And there are ways to address that. For example, one of them is uh, uh, beginning to establish one or more uh, quarries which are tech zero mines that that mine carbon. And the carbon takes the role of the rock and the gravel. And so we then established that this mine is producing, is mining quarrying rock that's going to be used for road construction. And, and we don't have to detail all that down, but we create this thing that creates, you know, construction material or creates carbon. And then we, we plug that into the infrastructure built. So we're just constantly funneling this amount of carbon uh, or construction materials to our infrastructure because our infrastructure constantly needs it and can keep adding to it. So what do we do is we want to improve our infrastructure. So certain builds, if I want to have a, a more advanced uh, uh, colonial center, for example, if I want a regional tower that can control my entire uh, 100 light year square area, then uh, I'm going to need to have at least my tech one completed and tech two started. So this is a misnomer, and it says it right there in infrastructure too, because infrastructure can quite be quite elaborate and can be quite basically simple. So <clears throat> on 100%, a planet is never 100% 100%. There's always going to be, if you, if you know anything about a city of any sort, if you get out far enough on the fringes or in certain remote areas inside the city limits, the infrastructure begins to deteriorate or almost become non-existent. It becomes very poorly maintained. <coughs> so one can make the argument that that is level one infrastructure right adjacent to level of four infrastructure. You can have dirt roads and poorly maintained pathways just behind the fence next to the airport. You know, okay, so that's how this plays out. And so there's always level one. So once we establish it's quote, quote finished, so we can start level two, uh, we never stop paying for a level one. We're going to maintain it forever. And it just adds to the expenses. So this pyramid becomes more and more, you know, resource and credit ex extensive over time. It helps moderate some of the retarded growth early on. This is a huge sink for credits and materials. It takes a lot and the bigger your build modifier the freaking worse that is. So what we want to know now is is what the infrastructure of this this place is. And it's going to say a uh, smaller medium sized NPC, NPC world. Add your, nodal, your, your noble status modifier to the roll. So I need to roll uh, N minus 50. So whatever I get here, minus, minus 50. So I can roll to 28. That gives me minus 50. You can't get a zero, so this becomes a one. It says, tech one infrastructure incomplete. Right? So this might be a fairly new trade world. Now this matters again. Once again, it's going to play out because it's not going to be as vast as what it might have been, which means the industrial capacity 
may not be nearly as fleshed out as we would like. It's still easy to say because it's a trade world, a lot of material flows into the trade world as well, and the manufactured material items and stuff. So pretty much everything we want might be available. The downside is, so when we look at manufacturing infrastructure, if I have a tech one or tech three infrastructure complete and tech four underway, then I can say this that this trade world produces pretty much every tech four item available that's on our purchase, you know, in our in our uh, our equipment guy. That makes things simpler and easier. So if we have a planet that has hasn't even completed its first level infrastructure, then it's going to lack any of the higher level factories. None of them are going to exist. There's going to be a lot of low level factories, lots of base stuff. So we may run into problems with this. We may run into problems because it's not going to be suitable. So I'm going to make the argument because this is one of those things where I'm common sense crap. Let's just go for fun and say it's tech. The tech one is complete, which makes tech two underway. And this at least allows for tech two and some tech three builds, depending on what they are, uh, and will improve improve our ability to acquire stuff directly. Because anything above that tech level, we will then have to do searches for. So if I I want to buy tech four uh, tech four weapon systems for my warships, uh, I'm going to have to have my factor my my uh, my merchant uh, uh, rep on the trade world as do a search and they're only allowed to do so many of these things to cycle so if i'm only allowed to do two searches and i have to you know find specific see if there's available stuff so i want to find uh i want to find level i want to find me a uh, tech three agronites uh, and so let's see if i can find some for sale then i have to task my my agent as a as a you know, investigate a form of investigation to see if he can find he or she can find something that somebody is selling that's been shipped in from someplace else, and so that's going to affect potentially the price, the availability of certain things, uh, and it also burns up that that slot. So I could be using that that search to search for a, a, a master engineer, so I can employ them, <laughs> or something else. So I have to you know. There's crap. So this is one of those reasons. <clears throat> it explains. It helps explain why this trade world will become my, the house's commitment to the trade world is going to become quite extensive at some point. The odds are pretty good. Most of my ministries, if not all of them, will open an office on the trade world. Now, whether they're all in the same facility, I rent a floor on a mega building or something like that, or my uh, intelligence ministry chooses to, to, you know, rent out the back room of a, a of a sloppy Joe's on the on the, uh, you know, on the lower end of the of the invector or something like that, uh, so they can stay under the weather and further away from the house business. That'll be up to the semantics and my choices that I make. That said, I have six ministries right off the bat, and ideally, I should have six. I should have six pers six agents represent one for each one that can do. Each one can do a search for things specific for that department that I need for that stuff, or they can be tapped to make other searches for other stuff. But keep in mind, this costs credits. Every one of them I have to pay, and I have to pay them a significant standard of living to keep them loyal to me. And then they'll need assistance. So now it's not just six, now it's 12 people, and I have to pay the salaries for them too. And in addition to all this, I have to pay, the house has to pay for their room and board. We have to establish all this. So we're going to set up a residence for these people, and we got to pay for it. And we got to set up an office, and we got to pay for it. And then the offices who are going to require some staff. So at this point, we're, we now got 12 people right out the door, and I'm probably going to want to have security. And ideally, each minister's rep would have a five-man detail that's broken up throughout the, their 10-day rotation, of course, and one person on duty at any given time kind of crap, and somebody in a backup position is, when needed, and so on and so forth. Uh, all sponsored and paid for by the house. Now, Theory, theory, in theory, you could hire these people from the plant. You send one person to the trade world, and from there, you hire a bunch of people to work for the house. 
there's positives and negatives to this. Keep in mind, when you want these people to do searches or negotiations, the fact that there, there'll be some negatives because they're employed by the house, they don't have the vested interest in it like you would if you were a member of kind of thing. So there's some checks and balances, some cost factors in those. And then the operational cost. It could be as, as much as 20, 30 credits a cycle to run a fully operational uh, purchasing office and all the bells and whistles that go along with it. And that's not including the, 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 the unforeseen crap. Because remember, what I, you may or may not remember what I have said in the past was, once we've established this trade world and we open an office there, we're, we're entitled to run event roles on this planet just like any of the others. So our people are, are present when these event roles take place. Now some of them will have nothing to do with the house whatsoever and we can look at them that way and, and dismiss them. But others may be something we want to take advantage of or get information on or run away from. We won't know until we see, but there's just the opportunities a lot. So you figure uh, on average you get one event roll plus you're going to have at least two ship traffic rolls. Now a trade world's probably got 50 you know, I'd say an easy, if you were to say an easy caveat would be 25 ship traffic rolls per infrastructure complete. So in this case, my tech one's complete and I got a tech two started, then we should have a minimum of 25, possibly 30 uh, ship traffic rolls every cycle for ships coming and going. Well, I don't know about you, I'm not rolling for that many damn ships, especially since most of them aren't going to have anything I want anything to do with anyway. That's that's crazy town. You start, you have to, at certain points, you have to start going, okay, I'm just going to let this ride and move on to the next thing. So, the other options, this is what I said. So, we end up with one or two that becomes attention, it comes to the house, the attention of the house agents. And at that point, you make a decision do you take advantage of it? Perhaps, you know, this ship comes in and you get wind of it. So, it's, uh, maybe you run down there and negotiate with the captain to buy all or part of their cargo at a reduced price to what the house or what the ship captain would have made selling it but at, at a significantly benefit so they still need to make a profit kind of thing or maybe it's something that you want to you know buy specifically for the house because you find they have a special on board you can take advantage of it's just like certain specials that crop up that you never wanted these are where you can go because we don't have to go after them. it's just the opportunity presented for this stuff You know, I, every, when I hit me with the damn diabetes, I switched over this Pepsi Zero. And it's like Diet Pop. I can't stand the taste of Diet Pop. This stuff only tastes right when it's bloody cold. It's got to be coming out of the freezer icebox cold. Out of the, I keep it packed in ice in a lunchbox, kind of cold. Because once it starts hitting that rim temperature, ugh, it starts to, I don't know, it gets coilingly bleh, right? Okay. So, okay, trade world, creating the trade world, determining level. So we're going to go IFR. First complete, second underway. And let's just see just how close they're done with it. So red, red, red being uh, the tens. So they are 81%. Now this is important because we can make we can make a caveat that said okay, if they're eighty one percent complete and obviously they're investing in trying to 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 build on this, perhaps they are nineteen cycles away from being completed and starting cycle or uh, level three. This matters because we keep trying from from you know 19 cycles out from or you know say 20 cycles out from uh, our current cycle at 17. So on cycle 37, uh, the trade world completes its Tech 2 infrastructure builds and begins to initiate Tech 3. This allows for new factories to be uh, popping up and open up. So those event roles that pop up matter because then the house becomes aware that this guild or that individual just opened up that new factory or in the process. 
And the, the, the beautiful thing is being a trade world and all the materials available and uh, the established guilds are already you know established, the construction outfits, all this stuff, uh, we don't, they don't have to worry about that. We just sit there and say, oh, okay, well, they just finished this infrastructure. This event says they're building a Tech 3 arms factory. And all I need to do is, okay, I got five cycles and that bitch is done. So if they're going to do that in five cycles, let's then go and look at, uh, let's start doing our pre-work, like what company and so on and so forth, so we can just you know, get in at the ground floor. You know, It's just like some of those event rules come up where this platinum or this guild wants to build. Well, you get or when your, your agents get wind of it, they're out at dinner or something, or they're entertaining somebody, and they hear the next guy at the table, next guy over at the next table going on about how their, their guild's looking to expand this. When they turn around, they come up and say, hey, are you married to this planet? You know, I know of another planet's a little further out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we can get you some land really, really cheap there. You see? You see that the, the endless possibilities and options that one, this, this one freaking link gives us. All right, so we also, like I said, this is good. We can establish that 20 cycles from now that then Tech 2 is done, and then they start Tech 3, which then we can make by that same figure 100 cycles up from that so 117 cycles from now so we could watch this trade world grow and if they stay and grow ahead of us faster than our house we st we benefit we still benefit from it right all right so it says here determine the size of the world's population roll d100 and multiply it by 10,000 and here i go with that crappy calculator right all right so 73 so times probably by 10,000 what is that 7.3 million, 750 million. All right, so 10,000 times 73. Yeah, 730,000. So we do this population. Add a thousand for the starting base, and so now we got 731,000. If IFR 1 is incomplete, add 1,000. If it 1 is complete, add 250,000. So now we have 733,500 population. If the world is an NPC house capital, minor house included, add 5,000, which it's not. Uh, and it goes on about uh, other modifiers for the house or, or the world, class B, class C. No, this doesn't qualify for those. And then we'll go up here to this one. And, uh, right, let me just, uh, yeah, we'll keep that one. Let's get rid of that one, right? And so up here we go to large NPC world. No, uh, yeah, that's probably a chart I should have used earlier and figured out my infrastructure because that would have. Yeah, let's, let's, let's just stick on where we're at right now. Uh, large NPC populations. Alright, so currently this trade world is, is fairly small, trade worlds go. It's only got 733,000 uh, population. And once again, if you think about it, I guess we'll keep that on after all, right? So if you think about it, uh, once again, the uh, if we keep track, irony of irony, you got another plant to keep track of. Uh, we look at the build popula the population modifiers and stuff for the trade world, and we keep track of it and keep that population growing because you know, at the end of the day, it's interesting, but it also has perks for doing so. But uh, it, it's uh, you know a small trade world on the lower end of things with potential to grow and if we want it to grow unfortunately we have to help manage the growth all right so it's just one of those things where you got to come down so and then we come down to things like towns and city most world's population broken up in towns and cities etc uh for example one way to determine how many cities are divided the population in half one half was spread out uh, into the plant uh planet hexes surrounding each of the cities, villages, and towns uh, into small uh, homesteads. Others would be divided roughly. So infrastructure uh, one complete. So this place would be for one city for every 250,000 people. So if we go by that factor, uh, there are approximately three city-sized uh, uh, 
cities on the planet. And we also have, uh, no, we have to cut it in half. So we take 730,000, divide it by two. So we're, we get about 30, 30, no, three, 375,000 each amount of people. So there's one significant city of 250,000 people or more, and then a smaller city, or more than likely it's their one significant city center, and then a bunch of smaller villages and towns that make up the balance. So half the population is living in the city, and then uh, a portion of the follow uh, is living in these larger uh, villages and towns that surround the city that eventually will become cities under them own. And, and they literally could be half a planet away. They could be... 100 miles down the road, 100 kilometers down the road, or they could be a thousand kilometers to the other side of the planet, and it doesn't matter uh, because the interconnectivity. So that would say that a big portion of this planet is still uh, untapped wilderness, which in a way is not necessarily un undesired because if you think about from the perspective of a guild. This is this, this is basically a free market zone. So the Imperium don't give a rat's ass what you do here commercially, economically speaking. So they can strip mine, they can pollute, they can do whatever the hell they want to do, and uh, the only body held accountable for it is their stockholders and their employees when they riot. I'm just saying, right? Uh, so keep that in mind. I mean, uh, this this is another reason you might not want it in your backyard, because it's going to become a cesspit and a half. Eventually get burned up, wear out, and then uh, if the trade dries up, then it'll move on and go down the road. Right? So, anyway, towns and cities, local government for NPC worlds. If the planets were up as trade world, following the trade world uh, conditions, the world would be uh, ruled by a board of directors made up representatives from the top 10 to 20 guilds on the planet. Beneath them would be a corporate conclave consisting of representatives from every guild with a headquarters or sector government uh, HQ on the planet. The world's ruled by, so we're talking trade world here once again. This is no democracy whatsoever. It is, you know, literally a corporate, a corporate corporatocracy or whatever. Uh, the biggest guilds have the most clout, and that's generally how it works. And the families within, they don't. The, the government doesn't give a shit how they, what they think, because this isn't a this is not a house run, a family run business. This is a corporate run business. And so, with all the bells and whistles, the positive negatives that go hand in hand with all that crap, right? Good to keep that in mind. So that said, we're going to move on to the true trade worlds and guilds, and it explains more about the true, uh, free trade loan the expansions, etc., etc. Typical blah blah blah. So in the galaxy and quadrant guilds, if the NPC of the world's IFR is three or higher, roll once on each of each of the following charts. All right. So we can't roll on this chart because our infrastructure is not high enough. Sector guilds. If the NPC world's IFR is two or higher, roll once on the following two charts. Now, infrastructure incomplete is still infrastructure. So this is tech two infrastructure, even if it's incomplete. So we get to roll on the sector guild uh, chart. No modifiers to it. So I rolled a 74. He's at the door. He's at the door. He's playing with my door. Is that you, Frankie? Got another kid and a cat on the other side of the door pulling the door because they want in. They hear me in here and they want in here. So I rolled uh, uh, 74 and that gives me 2d10 plus 5 gills. So number of gills present. So this is just a start because, like, once again, the event rolls over time. We'll expand this. We'll find new guilds. We'll negotiate. We'll find out if new guilds will come and establish stuff, right? We At this point, we will just be observers. We won't have any say in it. We just the event will occur, and then we will add that to our notes that a new guild. And then, it, it, you know, I don't know. We have to come up with our own pithy names for them and stuff, but however you want to play it out. So I rolled a 47, or uh, no, uh, excuse me, 2d10. So a seven and a four is 11 plus five. So equals 16, 16 guilds. 16 established guilds. And then we go on for regional and local guilds. If IFR two or uh, if uh, uh, IFR is two or lower, roll once on this chart. 
So technically, we can roll that chart and this chart. I might have to make some adjustments on it because I'm not sure I like that shit. That ought to be three and five. Three here or here. See? It just doesn't make sense to me. Okay, so anyway, 15, 16 established guilds is pretty good. Uh, fringe groups. Fringers can be found on any good side worlds thriving in the layers of shadow provided by credit massive populations. While small large worlds support shadow markets not, uh, not to be confused with sh a shadow port. Pirates of Smuggler Havens, cults and temples, recruitment centers, gutter uh, local thug gangs, as well as the ever-present syndicates. Particularly powerful French groups can even dominate their particular criminal niche. But fortunately, competition is always just around the corner. So we're talking with a small to medium-sized world. That's just what we picked on, or what I rolled or picked on, or picked to do. So uh, the number here, roll this, is five. So 1d5, 1d5, 5 or less, nope, 5 or less, nope, 5 or less, damn it, nope, 5 or less, on, there we go. So number of fringe groups equal 3 that we know of. So we're starting out with 16 established guild and three fringe groups that could be a pirate outfit it could be a smuggler outfit it could be any slew of things so one of the options we get here for that is an actual chart roll for the type of fringe roll and it says there could be varying a caveat here so there could be varying levels of competition between factions many of these might work loosely together maintain control of the basic services etc etc so if you if we were to get a, a, a trade world that was dominated by the criminal elements by the fringe groups uh, the guilds would still be nescently in charge, but perhaps a, a num more than a handful of these guilds are uh, criminally bent or fringe themselves. Or they're just covers for fringe groups. A very successful fringe groups will use legitimacy to help to protect and, and uh, move their, their, their credits per and generate more stuff and supplies and things like this. I mean, just saying, if you're going to operate a pirate fleet, uh, you're going to need a lot of resupply, a lot of uh, repair equipment, lots of parts. Well, wouldn't it make uh, economic sense to, to not, you know, you're going to, whenever possible, if you're sufficiently large enough to invest in your own facilities to manufacture some of the crap so you can get it on the cheap as opposed to depending on trying to steal it all the time or take it by force? I'm just saying how big of a, you know, you get a, qu a quadrant size uh, uh, pirate uh, operation who's running you know, a pirate lord who's got, got several, you know, a half dozen pirate princes and, and hundreds and hundreds of warships under his uh, beck and call. Uh, yeah, uh, now you're talking about and happen to be able to understand, uh, you know, logistics on the, that, that level of scale. You know, you can't run an organization that big and not take care of the little shit too. Jabba the Hutt's uh, criminal empire was only successful because Jabba manipulated a lot of the, uh, the nuts and bolts part of his organization too. Comes and goes with it, right? So if we wanted to know which of these three, let's see, a 40 is a cult. 29 is a gutter gang. And 25 is a second gutter gang. It's just like the 16 established guilds. I can choose to go and roll in guilds. One of the ways to do that is to go look at your platinums and roll platinums up to determine what their field is. And at that point, we're going to say, okay, this is a refining guild. This is a, a shipwright guild. And we may want to do that. Or we just want to make a caveat, there's at least one of everything on this planet. And the question is, is you know, how much? So when you talk about a population for, with under a million people, uh, the output production-wise is not going to be that great. So if I wanted to say that there is a heavy foundry on the planet, uh, with this number of people, I need to probably roll a, t a dice and say, okay, well, there's actually nine heavy foundries, and this is the amount of production they use. And, and if we look at the planet's size-wise, how much demand it gets. I mean, 
we can go down that rabbit hole. I mean, do you want to go to that level of detail? How much time do you got? You know, what's your thing? You know, you're, 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 this is not a game that, you, that you're going to turn around every day like this. You want, you're, you're, you're thinking something that ain't, this ain't. This is a long-term investment, both time and, and, and effort and willpower <laughs> at the end of the day. You know, it will overwhelm you. I have yet to find anybody who doesn't eventually become, oh my God, I just, there's so much, I can't do it all no more. At that point, start another game. You've, you've, you know, you've had fun, you've, you've gone as far as you've gone. Uh, you know, I don't know of anybody in, in 15 years, you know, I'd be going on 15 years. I say it's about 10 years to work on the book, but it's been, you know, about 15 years since I started on it. Uh, I don't know anybody's still running it, still playing it after 15 years. The longest was was nine. Uh, yeah, nine. Uh, me, I, I ran a house for nine years, uh, and, and my buddy Shannon ran one for some, almost seven, and, and then Kenny had one for three years, and, and I can think, you know, any, everybody else was much less than that, but because I think I had probably 15 or 16 people over the years that, that helped play test the game system. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, guilds, fringe groups, and we know what type they are. And they talk about setting up the exchanges, how to work them. Uh, then we go exploiting these worlds. Once, once you have located a trade world, a fringe port, or an other marginal colony, colony or NPC house controlled world, you may wish to tap the bustling trade. Okay, so once again, let's just establish that for a second. Um, keep going off on interconnected tangents. So we talk about NPC merchant ships all the time, and we know from our, some of our event role or ship traffic roles that there is at least one NPC house someplace within the, the, the quadrant that has got their own ships and bumping into my, uh, my colony. So we do not know exactly where, and at some point that's the next major investigation I kind of want to do, if I can pin that down, is where the hell is this other minor house? How far away is it? And at what established size is it? I.e., what's the infrastructure? Keeping in mind, the reason why my trade world isn't some whopping powerhouse is because uh, we have these modifiers for reasons. So my house imper my my uh, my house squire has a negative 50 to any of these kind of roles uh, to mitigate too much. So when I establish a second colony in a separate separate Col uh, colonized system, then officially my character, my house uh, uh, lord becomes a thane. At that point, that for 50% is reduced, I think it becomes 40%. And so as you go up, it goes down, it goes down quite a bit. So the next level is barren, and uh, I have I have only had two people make count, and nobody's made duke yet. Well, no, technically I my car my, my NPC house made duke but that house is kind of a scratch because it was more about trying to make sure everything works the way it's supposed to and consistently for t over time. And uh, sometimes things work great for a short period and then they have a weird way of, of changing and warping and, and going in directions that was not foreseen uh, or becomes problematic in ways that were not foreseen at the time because nobody expected the game to go that long kind of thing. Uh, I've run into that occasionally uh, on tabletop games that I've played, especially very early versions of stuff, where they didn't think very far past a certain level of stuff because they they, they just they were amazed that they were able to achieve what they did, and they were either they never they caught flat-footed and never recovered from that, or they build upon that, which is what most of the successful game companies have ever you know have, have striven to do. So anyway, we talk about explaining the worlds. Uh, establishing a house office, pretty much everything I've been talking about is all laid out, how you do this, how you go about doing it. Uh, then we talk about a section on brokering cargo and right, so one of the unique aspects of operating a finance office on any NPC world is the ability to speculate on merchant cargos. Keep that in mind once again because I kind of got sidetracked off of my uh, when I went on my tangent, I didn't go far enough on the tangent. All right, so out there in space, whether it's five light years away or 50, or other, other things, other colonies, if you will, 
So some of them might re remember our little pirate haven. We have a pirate haven on Fairwind itself. The rules for establishing and setting up that pirate haven are basically this section we just used, right? Uh, there's very little to it because my colony had very little to it. So our, tr our, our, our little uh, pirate haven was bare bones. Three, three light years away, perhaps, we will uncover a planet that has a, a smuggler's base on it. And the smuggler's base, the smuggler port, or an actual fringe port. And we get an event roll that says there's a fringe port here. Well, our fringe, fringe port is great because it's literally a port. In a way, it's what a trade world could become, or you know, a trade world could be, could sprout out of this tr this fringe port down the you know, many many centuries down the road or decades down the road. But for the time being, it's it's a still. If the house doesn't control it, if we can put somebody there. So wh one of, why I sent an agent to my private haven, that's why we have our gal who's masquerading as a barkeep at the, at the pirate's bar, so she can keep an eye on what's going on. So we have that event roll. We know when, ship, when the ships come and go there. And we can get a heads up on that as a house, as, as a purchasing options. We get a chance to get in there and maybe cut out the, you know, cut out the middleman or something like that. Uh, the other thing is, it's just being able to stay connected with what's going on. Because she's present, my house knows what goes on there every cycle. So if we establish that there's a fringe port three light years away, and we send an agent there who blends in, gets a job, or blatantly just opens an office there for sell, buying and selling crap, this gives us the ability to buy and sell crap from the trade world. It's just, that's the whole point of the trade world, or, or the fringe port. So the advantages, of course, the same thing happens to an NPC house. This is important because if you play this game with other players, and each one of your houses are adjacent to each other in some manner, eventually you're going to connect with each other because you know that you know your your friend or your associate is 15 light years in that direction. You know they're there because you are playing with them and you're in communications with them in some manner, i.e. as players you know what the other your buddy's doing. So you both can more or less agree to start exploring a path between the two to create that, that trace for communications and so on and so forth. Ideally, if you're the uh, a, a monitor, let's just say you could be the equivalent of a game master by overseeing a number of other players. Stop one, and I did this quite a bit over the years. One of the things you do is is you do all the roles for the events and the ship traffic for your you know players. Let's say you've got four people that you're monitoring while they're independently running their houses. So at the beginning of each cycle, they come to you and say, okay, here's cycle 22, and you would come back and you would roll for all the event rolls, all the major key rolls for that house and give them to the player, which you're gonna do this for everybody else too. <coughs> this allows you to tweak a few things. Keep that in your brain because we tweak shit all the time. So if, for example, uh, Player one gets this NPC house ship arriving. The, the the monitor can go and look at player three and say he has the ship that's closest to. So what if it's his ship that just stumbled into player one's possession? You don't tell player three or player one who the other side is. Let them figure it out. Now, if they figure it out amongst themselves, that that's that's on them. But if it takes them a minute for them to connect who the hell they're screwing with, and vice versa, a lot of crazy stuff can go down out of that. And I've seen it. I've done it. It's a fun way to run the game. A fun way to play it. <coughs> and then, of course, when you have a monitor, and, and this is one of these remote games kind of things set up. So if you had four players and you're running the, you're monitoring that you're the mass the game monitor whatever you want to fucking call it and um, so everybody's playing in their own time as long as they have an agreement uh, we'll have our shit done by Saturday morning 
right? And, and so you, the monitor gets everybody's results, and then it goes through and makes all the, the necessary rolls. But if you have the negotiation things come up, stuff like that, so if you know, the, all the stuff I've done for cycle 17, for example, the monitor can expedite this with the player by, by playing the NPC role for the player. So the player, you just sit down, you know, whether you're doing it via Skype or, or you're doing it in email or you're doing it across the table at work, you can just fire off, you know, let's do this negotiation thing. How do you want to do it? You make the roles for the for the NPCs uh, if that's how you want to go. So, I mean, th that's the beautiful sides of this game, right? So, we talk about brokering cargo, renting warehouse space. You know, once an office has been established, a house may rent a warehouse for at, on an NPC world at an additional cost of 5.5 credits times IFR level in credits per thousand metric tons uh, per space. So my colony effort since I sent a purchasing agent to the trade world and uh, for an a infrastructure of one being complete and two underway, uh, it would just be half a credit per cycle to rent a thousand storage ton, uh, metric tons of storage. And you go, well, that's a lot of storage. It's not, not really. You find it in a hurry that a thousand tons is nothing. Uh, I often uh, suggest paying that five credits per cycle if that's if that's what it is uh, to get that fifty thousand tons because then you have lots of spare, you know you have or, uh, or no excuse me that ten thousand tons of uh, cargo capacity because you're going to need it and you know, if you just think of uh, right off the bat I need you know a couple hundred tons of heavy of steel I would like to about fifty tons of heavy steel uh, probably another fifty tons of robotics uh, a couple hundred tons of construction material. Uh, this is all basic shit I need to build at least four of the builds I want to build, and that's just to get the materials home. So once, because like once I got the materials and I've actually paid for the construction, then I'm waiting for that construction turn to come up, and then the time it takes to actually do the construction. So there's values in doing this and, and, and um, keeping track of the shit, but the storage that's almost crucial because you're going to need a place. What if, you know, if ideally you're going to ship material, raw materials, uh, to the trade world that you immediately sell to the exchange. As soon as the ship arrives, they unload the cargo straight to the, straight to the exchange and the Bob's your uncle pocket the cash. Sometimes, though, uh, it doesn't always pan out the way you want to, uh, and you end up with cargo that you can't sell. So, for example, uh, I have on more than one occasion, because of event roles, acquired cargoes from you know a ship that's coming to the sh that's at the trade world uh, that's got nothing to do with the exchange uh, perhaps uh, I, I, uh, a a salvage deal comes up and we become aware that somebody's just abandoned 100 tons of something well we can immediately just grab it and move it to our exchange you know by arguing that we hired somebody locally to move all this shit to our warehouse I mean, you know, that's kind of what I'm going with. Uh, it's just like the, uh, the buy, somebody's got some war knights for sale on the side, I buy them. Well, now I need to, you know, they, they weigh 20, ton, uh, 20 tons a piece, and I buy 10 of them, that's 200 tons. Well, I need to have 200 tons of storage capacity to keep them stored because I can't leave them outside. And it gets stolen. And then I have to, at that point, accumulate enough material to make up a shipping, uh, uh, a shipment to send home by commercial transport. Or when one of my house ships arrives to be loaded up with to take it home. It's just like uh, buying things in bulk and selling things in bulk. The storage options give you some ability to actually play the market a little bit. Uh, the exchange markets tend to not ex vary very much. Once I've, I've, my argument was once you've established uh, the exchange, you should not have to worry about it again until the IFR changes. So on the trade world, the IFR changes, then we go back and we relook at, okay, was more guilds added? If that was so, then that means more factories were added. Uh, do we want to know what sort? Uh, ideally, we, that we sure want to know is have any higher tech builds been added? Uh, so this opens up the, uh, the avenue for just generally purchasing whatever we want straight off the exchange kind of thing. So, you know, it's just one of those factoring things. So uh, creating the uh, NPC exchanges, factoring demand, i.e. buying values, 
Just because the world with a huge exchange is high production, we want to make the allowances for the huge amount of surplus available for sale. Too much supply always drives down prices, so divide the surplus selling price by 10%. Factoring surplus selling blah blah blah. So in this case, uh, tech one uh, uh, complete, it would be one credit. So our base pro buying price to the plant's IFR modifier is one credit. So uh, we have to look at the, the other modifier goes. Now we factor, figure out foodstuffs and water, uh, etc. demands for the planet. Uh, then we have things like uh, exchange tonnage multiplier, factoring mine mineral resources. Uh, factory mineral resources in demand, so on and so forth. So it's like in the exchange, what we're going to need to do is establish this exchange. We're going to determine what, if any, uh, mined materials uh, can be mined directly on this planet, and then it will be assumed that everything else is within that, that, that three light year bubble. Remember, you know, we talk about uh, the, the, the trade world system itself, and then three light yards, and three light years in every direction takes us a bubble that's roughly uh, what 90 square light years, or, or no, uh, 30 square light years, 40, something like that. And that's a lot of space, a lot of potential planets, asteroids, moons, shit like this. So there's going to be a lot of mining. So this, of the 16 guilds, it's almost you almost guarantee that one of them should be uh, a mining guild. So my arguments, once again, for developing these worlds have always been to players. Look, look at your own colony to begin with. You started out with this, 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 and this, and this, and this. All six of these are going to be present on that trade world, period. After that, it's just a matter of are there duplicate guilds producing twice, you know, the same kind of material, or are we getting into much more uh, uh, others? So, in the case of having completed IFR one, for example, uh, we can have a medical guild because you can have a basic hospital starting with with as long as Tech one infrastructure is finished. I believe. So you you're able to build a medical center, and that medical center would then be uh, operated by a guild, blah, 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 so, right, and then, you know, just because the medical center, you know, a medical guild also would own factories, produce medical supplies, and so on and so forth, right, it just kind of all just kind of goes hand in hand with all that stuff, and then we want to determine factoring uh, mineral resources in demand, just like anything else, there's going to be certain things that are premium, so the thing to figure out is X amount of ma uh, MR that, that, the local mining guilds and concerns are able to mine in such numbers to keep the num the demand for them moderate, whereas opposed to the stuff that they can't. So this is going to increase the value demand, uh, demand and value for stuff that you can bring in and sell, but it might mitigate it. I irony of irony, perhaps if if FE iron ore is something you have in in in, in uh, you know cargo bay loads and you can't get rid of it fast enough so you start shipping it to the trade world because that's going to be your your uh, a primary source of, of money for you to you know, sell this surplus you can't use at home uh, but unfortunately perhaps the mining concern the local mining concerns and the plant itself produces a massive amount of, of uh, iron as well so fe so at that point the they're, they're not going to pay you very much for anything any of this iron ore you bring in uh, because uh, the house just isn't going to make any money on. So if you buy a speculative cargo, for example, a ship captain who's a ship merchant who's in trouble and needs to unload his damn cargo, and you just agree to buy everything on a ship, uh, and you can do that through negotiations and crap, and you end up buying a bunch of shit you don't want, and that you have a surplus up at home anyway, and the local exchange don't pay jack for it. So you're either going to pay the, it's going to go take up that storage capacity that you you know you're paying for, and it could be used for other stuff, or you're going to then have to decide what to do with it. Perhaps you'll find an alternate market someplace, a trade, another trade world, uh, or more likely an NPC exchange and some another NPC player, uh, or another player player if that's the kind of game you're running or involved with. That at that point, if you can get it from here to there, you can then ship this stuff you got on the dirt cheap that you can't make any money at this planet for and ship it to that place because they're buying it for and enough to make it worthy, uh, worth making the effort to get rid of it. In a pinch, in a pinch, you just sell it to the exchange and you take the loss. 
The idea basically is I didn't make jack on it or very little on it, but I wanted to get it out of the warehouse. I absolutely have no space for it, and this is how you do that. Uh, whereas opposed at, at your home, your mining facility, you know, maxes out on iron or it stops mining it. You hit the warehouse limit set by your exchange and, uh, and your capacity for storage, and at that point, it doesn't matter after that, right? And so it all kind of plays down in, the, in that kind of stuff. So the opposite, that's going to be factoring demand for manufactured materials. Well, it sets most large MPC worlds apart from their smaller cousins is the excessive production of manufactured materials, gear, and other products. This means that most MM can be found cheaply in large quantities of boon for any house trying to build an empire. But like any world, it will have a limited number of manufacturing materials in demand. MM is the local production that can't keep up with. So, that said, perhaps this particular world has as great a demand for heavy steel as... Uh, you know my homework so I'm not going to come here and buy heavy, uh, heavy steel for cheap no I'm gonna to have to buy it at the inflated prices because the demand on the heavy steel market has high that way any heavy steel that gets shipped into the colony or into the trade world gets bought up by the trade world because it immediately gets applied to the factories that use it so if I've got a, a an aerospace corporation producing starfighters and ship components uh, they're going to require a lot of heavy steel every cycle to operate so this jacks up the price of that item and this is how we establish, so in this case it suggests 1d4 plus 1. So we roll 1d4 and let's say we get a 3. And then we would go to the manufactured material list and roll for 3 items. These 3 items will become the ones that are exaggeratedly in demand. So there's always going to be a, a demand for them as opposed to being a surplus. And sucks for us if those are 3 items we, do, we really want. To, uh, want. So what that then means is we can still buy the heavy steel. We can buy all the heavy steel we want. We're just going to pay that extremely high rate for it. We're going to highly inflated rate. So this is going to mitigate how much of the heavy steel we buy. It might be just cheaper to buy the manufactured items until we can get our own heavy steel factory up and running. So perhaps we'll buy just enough heavy steel to get by and then get this other, get our own facility up and running as soon as we can. Uh, meanwhile, it still may not be production enough kind of thing, and we still have to buy from the exchange. We're just going to buy it at a god-awful inflated price. Now, that uh, brings us factoring, manufacturing, material surpluses. Uh, okay, uh, new, uh, uh, new uh, MPC world tax modifiers. Now, these are all things we can apply if we really want to know. Uh, it says true... Uh, True trade worlds do impose their own taxes upon the citizens living and visiting the world. As part of an imperium free market zone, the planet is allowed to have an active exchange with grants of a Class A status. Bureau of Revenue and Financial Oversight, or the BRFO, assigns each trade world a tax modifier based upon its level of its infrastructure, etc., etc., etc. Most of this doesn't matter to us financially speaking. Uh, we don't give a shit what kind of profits the damn trade world is making for themselves. Uh, if you really want to know, the mechanics are here for you. Uh, the mechanics are mostly meant for like the, the NPC world. So if you come up with a small NPC house, keeping in mind that it, it, at our current squire status, the odds of this, this other minor house is going to be one, maybe two, maybe three tops, three colonized uh, planets. Probably the one that passes as their capital for sure, and then one or two you know, secondary colonies. Uh, so by definition, it means they're probably a thane. But we roll for that, and we get that negative 50. So we're not going to see a, a house that's a baron. We're not going to have a barony next door to our to our squiredom, because then we would be grossly outclassed just by sheer numbers of, of stuff. We would be at the mercy of this other house and constantly whine into the Imperium for help. And, or we would ignore the barony altogether, then what's the point in having? So that kind of stuff. And we'll go on to some more information. Imperium, tra and, Imperium uh, and trade worlds, uh, about how the Imperium and trade worlds interact, I guess should probably how that says. Uh, property taxes for rent, crap like that. Uh, Imperial bureaus of 
or some anyway. So this is just a fun list of uh, different government bureaucracy. The Bureau of Revenue and Financial Oversight, Imperium Mercenary Review Commission, Star Marshal Service, Bureau of Starship Operations, Registry, and Interstellar Navigation. Bureau of the Imperium Star Navy, the Imperium Terran Legion Command, the Imperium Defense Administration Command, Bureau of Cultural Preservation Oversight, the Imperium Historical Society, the Bureau of Justice and Order, the Bureau of Health and Medical Development, right? Gotta love the acronyms, lots and lots of acronyms. So we have a sample trade world here, Dimetu, uh, prior to blah, blah, blah. So everything you would theoretically want to know or need to know about our trade world is here uh, as an example for creating your own and as, uh, you know, so we break this down. It just shows that you can break these down. You can really get your numbers and if you want to go and do the hard, the hard math, because I've done it, I know. Right, so this planet here, the Mudu Trade World, has 97 million population. There are uh, planetary information, all kinds of detail stuff there, and we look at city builds. We have 670 housing concern ones, 495 housing concern twos. 15 PCs, 57 Skyrakers. Right. There's 15 heavy arms companies, 175 storage facilities, 10 uh, galactic uh, branch, uh, branch offices, uh, 1,908 light foundries. 360 repair bays, 8 shipyard 1s, 2 shipyard 2s, 5 space docks, 75 construction companies, 45 refineries. I mean, just, just goes on and on and on. I forget what some of those acronyms stand for. All right. So, and then we have the, the trade, uh, the example uh, trade exchange. All right how that kind of stuff works out yeah it's a mouthful and it's it's uh, a little bit of work but once the trade world's up and set up and running uh, the only things I really would care about maintaining on it is that that growth I want it to grow so I want to establish that in 19 cycles it's going to complete that tech 2 infrastructure and begin the tech 3 which then opens up events for construction of tech 3 factories and some potentially some tech 4 stuff. But we want to know that because this increases the production rates at the, at the colonies. That's just like what guilds are there? How many guilds? Well if we establish that certain guilds are coming to our colony uh, one of the things we can ask them is hey do you have an office over here? And by process of an elimination, you can fill in the list of the major guilds. And I would argue the fact that this is the 16 major guilds that are on the controlling board of directors for the trade world and its, uh, its environment. Not unreasonable to, to believe that there's probably three times, maybe, you know, if there were tens of millions, I'd say 10, oh, ten times, but say at least three times as many. Uh, minor guilds, little operations. Now, our Platinums are not guild masters until they get to that 10th bill. And then they become a plutocrat, if I remember right, because they actually have a hierarchy too. So the Platinum, the plutocrat, technocrat, uh, autocrat, something like that. So these fellows, as they expand, so a platinum to become a, a technocrat or uh, whatever uh, is going to take 10 bills. And then it's another 10 bills to make it to the next level and so on. So by the time they hit that megacrat or whatever, autocrat, megacrat, whatever the hell it is, they've got at least a minimum of 50 bills into the, on, in the, that constitute their guild. And then they would still be considered a minor guild because, geez, you know, if my agri concern platinum builds four more agri concerns perhaps he opens two on some secondary planets and then two more on my capital planet that brings him to five builds the one he initially started with 
five builds, and, and then his and let's assume he builds a state at some point. So now we're at six six of his ten builds, and that estate counts. That's why there's a limit on how many estates they can have and how they can establish them. So uh, six. Now in theory, he could choose to build a a guild regional office. But the requirements for it, I think, is that he has to have at least 10 belts. So he can start pl planning to build his regional office, but his 11th build, perhaps, will be the GRO. So at this point, he's got six. He needs four more. And he chooses to build a housing concern, uh, his own village or town. He builds a housing concern, and we can define it as rather it's one massive building. It holds 10,000, 15,000 people, or it's 10... 1,000, you know, apartment blocks that hold 1,000 to 1,500 people, or 10 separate towns that hold that surround his agri concerns or whatever. However, you want to define it out on your maps doesn't matter. Uh, or it could be a town literally of of 150, you know, 10 man, uh, 10 person residences. However, the math wants to work out doesn't make a difference. But he builds a housing concern. Now we're at seven, right? So maybe he decides to cash in on some fauna that's, that's herd worthy and he establishes a ranch. And now we're at, at eight. You see how this worked. And this all takes time. It takes resources, material, and effort. But we can walk each one of our platinums up the tree just as our, our house lord advances in rank. The platinums grow too, which benefits the house because every one of these bills expands our, our, our availability of materials and, has, and, and gobbles up lots of resources we would otherwise chuck away and lose money on or, you know, it's, it is what it is. So... It's important for these guys to do this stuff. Now that said, too, it's uh, go back a little bit on the circle thing. So the house, once I send this, send somebody, and once again, I've already contracted with this captain, so I have a limited amount of cargo capacity and a limited amount of passenger space. So I have to determine who, what, where, and why is going to go on the initial trip. And once they're there, what we're going to do, how much I'm going to try to ballpark how much I'm going to need, so they have X, then send extra. And then I want to send in addition to that a considerable amount extra uh, because I want that resources to be used for buying a lot of crap I can't manufacture. And uh, and of course we have to, like I said, we have to rent some kind of residential, an office for the for the for the operation, a warehouse for storing stuff, and residence of some sort. And of course, the more the richer the world, the more elaborate the world, the more costly that shit can be. Our standard of living for our, our individuals should be moderately high, so they're not, we don't want to look like a bunch of bums. Uh, we also don't want to get, you know, we want to keep them fat and sassy so they they stay loyal to the house. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, in case we get that event roll where somebody tries to corrupt one of them, kind of crap. Uh, plus all the bells and whistles, security support, things like that. And then I have to make some decisions. You know, how many people can I send? And I think, like I said, this this chartered ship is going to limit that. I don't think I'm going to be able to send too many, uh, which is fine. Because my initial foray is just to get there and get started. Because once we do that, the next ship going through, I could once again send another wave of people, another branch of the uh, of the of the, of the service. Uh, my my military is going to want to you know want something there. Uh, my intelligence ministry is going to want somebody there because their their priorities are different from the other ministries. So things that you might want to achieve on that trade world, take advantage of, get information on, uh, whatever. You want to have the right assets for it. So, you know, if I send my intelligence ministry, I have a, a, a sales rep from my, or a purchasing agent from my ministry, uh, intelligence ministry go, this person is going to have to also act as, a, as a kind of a, a, uh, uh, a, station, a station chief because this is going to begin the nesting uh, tendrils of the, my uh, Fairwind uh, intelligence service on the trade world. Because I want to be, I want to know things. I want to be connected. I want to have that advantages for all that crap. So I'm going to establish this. So I'm going to send on only a purchasing agent, but they need an assistant. So ideally, one of these two should be considered a 007. So we actually have a spy on 
call that we can tap to do things if we need to. The downside, of course, is anybody we can put in the field comparatively to the tech level available on the trade world, we're at a disadvantage. But this implies, this is in turn, is why our, our, plant, our, our noble status modifier is so important for these roles. Because once again, my level one, tech one capable spies, no match for anybody with a tech five infrastructure base. These people are going to have to, you know, they're going to run circles around my, 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 uh, you know, clown-like attempts at, at espionage. Uh, so we need something that's more along our speed, and that's what this allows. We're there, we're at a disadvantage, but because of the, the where we're at, we can acquire gear and equipment that will give us the bonuses that will help mitigate that gap. But the gap's not so grossly wide, you see that. But so we can make some advantages of it. This is also gives us the opportunity to buy specialized gear and craft that we otherwise will be a long time before we can manufacture at home and ship it home in s small enough quantities to, to start a, a stockpile. So uh, spy, net, spy stuff. I mean, that's one of my lists of shit. So ideally, one of these people, one or two, would be at least two of these people on this trip, ought to be from my intelligence ministry, and uh, they too are going to bring a cred stick, and it's going to be much smaller than uh, the one that the finance ministry and commerce gets. But uh, but they, I have a black budget for a reason, so I have been accruing x amount of black, uh, credits in this black op since I uh, black uh, budget since I started the house. So I have a little bit of extra there, so I can send twenty or thirty credits along with our our special you know our our special agent and his his or her associate and with the understanding that they're going to use that to purchase much needed uh, resources and equipment for my intelligence ministry you know and use it wisely so you know and we have to take that in mind too because what we spend is all we're going to have available to us until the next round of shit comes so if i go there and i bring some cargo that i can sell and make even more credits uh, that then I have that credits and I use those credits to purchase re uh, the manufactured material components and things I desperately want, and it, and ship them back. Unfortunately, uh, it won't be on this merchant ship because he was a one-way trip. So potentially we get there, we try to negotiate again for a return trip, and if not, then we at that point we just go to the commercial. Uh, we can uh, we get an event roll that allows a, a an independent captain to come up. Or you could choose to have your agent do a search for an independent captain, following the search parameters, and whether that pans out or not. Otherwise, you know, it's commercial freight. Uh, now your house is established, and we establish with the trade world is that they're always going to be commercial freight, to, to willing, people willing to take commerce back and forth. The question will be is how freaking expensive will it be? Because there's so much unknown space, and we don't. And we, and of course, the player will. Well, they already know all of the space. They would have explored all of it. Would they have? How do we know? We can't work on the assumption that all these NPCs and guys just have carte blanche for everything because that ain't how shit works. So we have to assume they don't know the route. They know. They know that the safe destination is my house, and they know this is where the trade world is. So unless they have a ship that can make one, that entire 29 light year jump in one movement, you know, i.e. one jump takes them the entire 29 light years, which there are no ships that can do that, they're going to have to make at least two or three or more stops along the way. This is where the risk factor comes in. And even after they've established their paths back and forth, they're not being paid to share that information with the house. So we have to pay those inflated prices for shipping people and goods. So sometimes it's cheaper just to send the cash and an agent one way and then arrive, you know, pay for everything to be shipped back than it is to try to ship stuff too and then ship back. Uh, this is where our own ships come into play. So once again, now that I have access, once I've established my agencies on uh, the trade world and I can start purchasing Tech 2 components, well, Tech 1 infrastructure is complete. They started Tech 2. That means all Tech 2 and Tech 1 ship components are available for sale on the trade world. And I don't have to go, Mother, may I? How many are there? I say, oh, well, there's only one. Well, in this case, I can say, no, I want to buy four. Uh, uh, I want to buy 20, 20 SLDs, and I want to buy four fuel cell, uh, Tech 1 fuel cells and two Tech 1 hulls. It's just a matter of having the cash to pay for it and having the means to ship it back to the house. 
Now, if you really want to get into a pinch and you got deep enough pockets and you're clever enough, you could purchase all the damn components necessary to build a damn ship at the trade world. And then you would then turn to negotiating with one of the trade world's ship, shipyards. And in the case of this planet, there might be only one or two and uh, find out how long of a waiting queue they have because you know it, you might get you know lucky and it's only three three days and, and they'll start the next project and that could be you or it might be 300 days and you know you're, you're going to be 30 cycles from now you finally get your ship you know, started on by that time you could have shipped everything home and built it yourself right or you send somebody out into the underside of the colony of uh, the trade world and see if you can't find a shuttle, a shuttle um, mechanic, somebody who's willing to it runs a, a shop on the side or willing to you know do some work out of his backyard or something like that to assemble your ship and hope they do it right and it doesn't fall apart on you or missing something critical like I don't know it's a fuel cell when you make that that single jump out of the system and find out the only gas you had was what was in the machine, was in the engine. So, um, just take your risks, right? So yeah, at the end of the day, you do, right? So I hope this helps a little bit with anybody that's interested in this and give a little better understanding of just what it is I, I go on and on about when we talk about the trade wars. The very fact that uh, this really is a, I don't want to say a game changer, but this is inevitable. Sooner or later in your game, you're going to establish these. Now, whether that this is established as an NPC house at their exchange, with all the good and bad that goes with that, or an actual trade world. So, it might take a while to find that trade world. It might take you a while to even think about asking to find the trade world. It, 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 and that may choose never to get a trade world off. Perhaps we had pursued uh, the earliest uh, uh, indications that some of my dressing traffic is from a minor house. So what we want to do now is establish, is this, this, you know, what's the minor house? And at that point, every new minor house ship coming in, we would then say, okay, 20% uh, or less, you know, it's, it's owned and operated by somebody from that planet. And... Uh, go from there now if we got multiple NPC ships coming in then we have to ask ourselves okay is there yet another NPC house nearby uh if if so how big are they how long have they been there etc etc and our house noble modifier plays a critical role in keeping them small so chances are that the NPC house that's visiting me maybe only has a couple ships maybe 10 ships tops and it wasn't until I hit Baron that I had more than 10 ships. I mean, it's just the, the time it takes to acquire, acquire all the materials, unless you get lucky and you just purchase them outright. Or, and, and I'm not talking, uh, I'm not talking contracts because you can acquire, uh, you know, more ships that way, but you've got to limit yourself. I mean, if your entire military is dependent on mercenaries and you run out of money, you're screwed, you know. And even if you have money, you're still not 100% guaranteed to their liability and they'll never be fanatical and it's the same with ship captains so your entire navy could be based on uh you know mercenary ships or independent uh, uh, scouts and independent traders and so on and so forth but that comes with all the problems and all the the unreliable factors that go hand in hand with that stuff all right anyway i've run on probably well enough and uh i'm all good with it i, I kind of had mixed feelings about the day but uh the wife and I went up to the shop so she could clean the off, clean the off. She goes up every two weeks and cleans. Uh, boss boss lady pays her, you know, pays her a little money on the on the side. It's not very much, just just some mad money kind of thing. And uh, with uh, our office manager having quit, Janice is a uh, she's not pro, she's not a morning person, so she's coming in in the afternoons and late and early evenings kind of stuff. So, you know, Brynn would normally do it on a Monday, late Monday morning. Uh, we just, just figured we'd just go up to the shop and uh, it allowed me to do some extra stuff up there too. So we, we got all that done. Uh, that meant coming home and doing some videos and half of me was just tired. I, I spent the whole weekend, I've had pretty much a nice, a really nice relaxing weekend. Uh, it's not been very stressful, which is good. And, uh, uh, here we are coming on the third day, so Sunday what's left of it anyway. 
I'm fixing to go make some uh, make late lunch now, and uh, just kind of been I don't know kind of dragging ass all weekend. The weather's been nice. Uh, we ran some errands yesterday. I went and took her to uh, go get a new pair of shoes and a couple other things we needed to do and uh, a little bit more of the, the tax refund money that we haven't got yet. I just used them for that, pay for that. And uh, other than that, you know, uh, I plan to do <laughs> more videos than I did, but I knew I wanted to get this video for sure and this one was going to be a bit of a lengthy one. I get it. Anyway, uh, I'm going to call it a day. Figure out who the hell's been scratched at my door. I suspect it's Frankie. Till next time. Well, hell, you know what? Let's hit the other button. It's just irritating to no end.